Yeah, this is great. This is good seeing everybody, isn't it, Paula? Yeah, it's so nice to see people's faces. It makes it more interactive. Obviously, we wish we could be in person. Um, hopefully, sometime later this year or early next, we can do something in person would be really cool. Um, but I, I think we could just kind of start kicking it off, right? Um, so I'll just introduce myself. My name is Pola. I'm with the Hazelwood Green Plaza and Hazelwood Local team. We're building out strategic community programming for the Hazelwood neighborhood as well as Greater Pittsburgh. And one of our key pillars of programming that we're going to begin to launch is educational programming and workshops and hands-on activities that help build technical and job skills. And robotics is actually a big part of the Hazelwood Green project. Uh, we have a bunch of robotics companies working out of our Mill 19 building. So it seemed totally made, it seemed like it totally made sense to have a panel discussion around Pittsburgh's role in the robotics industry, which if you don't know, is a pretty big one. Um, so we're super excited to have this awesome panel of speakers from around the city and the region here. I'm gonna pass it on to Joel Reed from the Pittsburgh Robotics Network, who's gonna kick off the panel. And I'm excited to see this great conversation. Paula, thank you very much, really appreciate it. Uh, I wanna thank you also uh, a big thanks to Hazelwood Local and all the folks involved there. Um, I think this is a really great event and some good topics for us to be exploring. I also want to acknowledge and thank uh, Pastor Tim Smith uh, from the Center of Life. Uh, we've had a chance to speak with him. Uh, it was great um, getting to know him and we're looking forward to doing more uh, in partnership with the community. Um, I'm gonna be moderating today's event. My name is Joel Reed. Uh, I am representing the Pittsburgh Robotics Network. Uh, we are an association that represents all the great things that are happening here in Pittsburgh uh, around uh, robotics. Um, before I get started, just a couple of uh, uh, logistical notes. Uh, I am launching a poll right now. Um, we would like for you to uh, please complete that question. We generally wanna know who's here. Are we talking to students? How many students are we talking to? Teachers, parents, uh, folks from the economic development uh, community or other organizations. The answers to that poll are completely anonymous. Um, and so uh, this is for us just to get a sense uh, who's in the audience. We do encourage questions. We would like for this to be as interactive as possible. We have a very large panel and so we do have some really great um, you know, items to discuss. Uh, but please put your comments in the chat and we will answer some questions throughout the conversation, but then we will reserve uh, most of those for the end. Also towards the end, we're gonna do about 60 minutes worth of talking um, with our panelists. And then at the end, uh, we'll have about 30 minutes to take your questions. If you would like to, uh, to actually address this through the video and through your audio, uh, you can click the reactions button at the bottom and that allows you to raise your hand. So just like we're sitting in the classroom, raise your hands and uh, we'll, we'll try to get to as many people uh, as possible. Um, we, and finally, I just want to encourage everybody, please don't be shy. Uh, we can learn from you just as much as you might learn from us. Uh, so we would like to hear your voices um, and understand. We welcome your curiosity and uh, we, we believe that all questions are good questions. So real quick for me to kick things off, you may or may not know, Pittsburgh is one of the world's top robotics communities. In fact, we're one of the top three communities in, in many respects. We're we're number two, and, uh, we're, and we're fighting for that number one spot. Um, the first public concept of a robot uh, that was promoted uh, to a general audience uh, came from Pittsburgh. Westinghouse had introduced a robot called Electro, Electro, and he had a dog named Sparko, and they actually took that to the World's Fair in 1939. And then following that, Carnegie Mellon University ended up pioneering uh, education and research. So right in our backyard, um, they're doing some really cutting edge innovation to develop things that we call robots today. And uh, in the last five to 10 years, we've had an expansion of companies that are here uh, that are growing rapidly. And we're gonna talk about how uh, the opportunities are emerging and, and how we might be able to access. We actually have between 70 and 100 companies um, building robots right here in Pittsburgh today. So Pittsburgh, believe it or not, you may not be aware of this, has walking robots, we have driving robots, we have flying robots, robots with legs, robots with arms, uh, robots that are actually growing our food, 
and even delivering stuff right to our doors. And there's probably more applications that I could talk to talk to about. If you've been, you know, if you could, once we can get back out and start traveling again, you're going to see robots at, at the airport. And a lot of this is happening uh, in and around the Hazelwood area, and that's our focus uh, today. Hazelwood was the center of a major industrial revolution in the past with the steel industry, and it's becoming that way again. And we want to make sure that these job opportunities are available uh, to everybody. So you might be wondering about robotics. This is probably why you come out. What is it? What opportunities are there for me? Uh, we're going to have a very high level overview uh, with today's panel. We have some really great examples of people who have gotten into this space uh, from coming from different backgrounds. And so this should be able to inspire you and we hope to inform you um, with, with what you might be able to do, you know, if you're interested. So I'm going to go through introductions and then we're going to get to the panel. So uh, Anna Nesbitt, Anna, could you wave uh, to everybody? I'll start with you. Anna is actually a senior in high school. Uh, who is about to embark on her career uh, after graduating. Uh, she's a team member of an organization called Girls of Steel, and Anna's going to tell us a little bit more what that organi or organization is. And not only was she a participating member of Girls of Steel, but she's actually giving back and teaching uh, to younger uh, students in, in earlier uh, grades. And I think that's really amazing because the sooner we can start understanding uh, this technology and these applications, the better. So she's going to tell us what students could be doing today and uh, help us consider what it might mean to look at a career in robotics. So we have uh, Malik Rivers. Malik, can you uh, give a big wave there? There you go, wearing his RE Squared shirt. I love it. Uh, so Malik is an electrical engineer at RE Squared. Uh, it's printed RE2, but they call it RE Squared. So Malik went to Pitt, uh, where he studied electrical engineering. And this alone gave him a lot of choices in his career, but he was telling us that he's an inventor at heart and he was drawn to robotics. Uh, he has participated in a number of team robotic activities, one of them called the First Robotics uh, Competition or FRC. And he's gonna talk about this and, and how he ended up in robotics and, and what he does on a daily basis. Next up is Don Besney. Don, there you go. So Don's actually a military veteran. I worked with Don at I Am Robotics. Uh, so I was, was fortunate enough to spend time with him uh, working there. Uh, again, he's a military veteran who joined the Navy while in high school and spent 15 years receiving on the job training and experience. Don has followed what sometimes is considered a non-traditional route. And I'm not even sure it should be called that because what is traditional, right? Um, especially in a growing industry. Um, but this, this is a very important part of the industry. When I was at IM Robotics, some of the hardest jobs uh, we had to try to fill uh, were non-engineering jobs or, or technician uh, level jobs. And in some cases, this does not require a college degree. And I think that's an important message uh, that we'll talk about today. Tom Lowers, uh, Tom, where are you? There you go, right in the middle for me. Uh, so Tom has actually received an advanced degree uh, in robotics and he started and he's the CEO of his own company, which is called BirdBrain Technologies. BirdBrain sells easy to use kits that allow students to design, build and program a robot out of any materials. I was looking at it yesterday, Tom, I have to get one of those kits, it looks pretty cool. Uh, I myself uh, should be playing around with uh, more of that stuff. Tom's gonna talk about you know, what it would take and what for you to consider if you wanna be one of the, a leader in the field like Tom uh, in, in that regard. And then uh, almost finally, we have Kyle Saucy. So Kyle, hello, good to see you. So Kyle is actually in the neighborhood. Uh, he works for uh, the Advanced Robotics for Manufacturing Institute or otherwise known as ARM. And uh, they are located at Mill, 9, Mill 19 in, in Hazelwood. And what he does is he actually facilitates education and workforce development activities. So among many things, he thinks every day about how to place workers in high, val high value jobs in this new and growing industry. Uh, studies, some studies have shown that there are 4.6 million jobs are gonna be needed in manufacturing in the next 10 years. So this is a really good opportunity and we just have to get started to let you know about those. And then finally, then I'm gonna stop talking, uh, you have me. Uh, and I'm someone who works in marketing and sales in this industry. Point is, is you don't have to be an engineer uh, to work in this field. And actually, I think it's one of the bigger opportunities in Pittsburgh as we create a lot of the commercial jobs. Uh, we're going to need people in sales, 
uh, marketing, we need writers, we need designers, we need project managers. managers. Uh, there are going to be plentiful jobs in this industry as we continue to, to grow. So let's go ahead and dive in. And I've asked Tom to start us off by just starting with some Robotics 101. So Tom, what is a robot? All right. So um, the interesting thing about that question is that uh, not all roboticists will actually give you the same definition of what a robot is. So the definition that I like to use when I'm talking with students and teachers is that a robot is something that is built by people and that senses its surroundings. So it has one or more sensors. It can think or plan with that sensor data and then it can act in the world. And so, you know, when you think about what that means, um, obviously something like the Mars rover Perseverance is a robot and everybody agrees that's a robot. But I might say that your home heating system, which is a furnace, you know, that it senses the temperature, it turns the furnace on, it has a plan. Some, some smart thermostats have some very complicated plans for when to turn that, that furnace on or off. Um, that's also a robot or at least a robotic system. And so when you think of robotics that way, you actually see that robotics is not just some science fiction future thing. It is actually in your homes. It's everywhere. Um, so yeah, I think that's a that's a good way to think about it. Sense, think, act. And 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 Tom, the thing about robots today is that they're becoming a lot more intelligent, right? Through the software mm -hmm. uh, that's driving them. So that's that's where we start getting into artificial intelligence and and them going a step beyond just um, you know heating our homes or washing our dishes. Yeah, absolutely. And even the algorithms for heating our homes and washing our dishes are getting more intelligent. And like a dishwasher may have had one sensor in the past, and now it has 10 sensors and some very complicated plans for what to do with that sensor information. So ev everything is getting more complex, but in ways that, that allow us to do more and be more efficient, actually, in, in many cases. I think even in Pittsburgh, uh, our traffic lights have a lot of this mm -hmm. intelligence that's built in and we'll talk to quote unquote driving robots at some point. Um, but I know that they're actually trying to make it more efficient when we're driving on the roads. And that's a really good example of using sensor information, uh, data around us, and then actually interacting you know, with the world. I mean, in a way that's robotic, isn't it? Oh yeah, absolutely. So you can almost think of like the entire uh, system of, of networked streetlights as a, a single robotic system. So like the city almost becomes a robotic system. I, I think one of the great things about opportunities in robotics, and it's really represented in this panel here today, um, a, most, a lot of robotics are driven by software, right? It's the algorithms, um, you know, it's, it's the controls and so on and so forth. Um, but it's very physical as well. So there's a mechanical part of, to it. And I think that's important, you know, in an industrial town like Pittsburgh, where people might have past skills, those skills are extremely valuable. Um, in many ways, we kind of mirror the automobile industry uh, in that we are deploying a physical product. So it has to, it has to work mechanically, it's got electrical controls. Um, there's a lot of math involved, there's a lot of physics involved, safety is a major concern. And by the way, it all has to be extremely reliable. So I think people can see that once once this starts becoming more pervasive, there are going to be enormous job opportunities and very diverse job opportunities. Yeah. Okay, great. Does anybody else want to add anything real quick to what is a robot? Did, did we kind of capture it? I, I and I I just I I'll, I'll close on this. What Tom told me, you know, he, he mentioned the furnace, but he mentioned before the dishwasher. He said when robots become products, they're no longer robots. And in, and I'm always amazed in a in a you know, in an older city, Midwestern city like Pittsburgh, we are surrounded by robots, but they're becoming co commonplace. And a lot of it is because we're testing, um, but we're starting to see some of them really enter into society. And I think that we just accept them. And these, these are uh, hopefully are gonna be robots that are gonna be, uh, you know, add a lot of uh, productive value, you know, to our lives. Okay, well, thanks a lot, Tom. So what we want to do is we want to hear from each of the panelists about their own stories and, and find out how they got involved uh, in robotics. And I'm hoping with our students and our teachers who are working with students and parents, you know, you will recognize some of these moments at this very time 
you know, in your life. And so hopefully some of this can inspire you. And then if you have questions, uh, we're going to post some information a little bit later. Um, but, but this is where, where we really intend to try to be helpful to you and, and uh, uh, make sure that everybody has a chance to get involved. Um, and, and robotics can be intimidating too. So I think that a lot of us might even have an interest in it, um, but we weren't entirely certain how to get started. And, and, and these folks can really talk about that. So let me start with Anna. Anna, I mentioned that you're part of this great organization called the Girls of Steel. Uh, can you tell us more about what that organization is? Yeah, um, so the Girls of Steel is an all-female robotics team for high school, uh, for high school girls. Um, and we're under an organization called First Robotics. So we're part of the First Robotics competition team that uh, Joel mentioned for Malik. Um, and that means that every year, the 50 to 70 girls on our team are tasked with building an 120 pound robot in around six weeks. Um, but it gives a lot of on hands-on experience in robotics because you're put into different sub teams uh, where you specialize in say programming or electronics or um, welding, but you also get the experience of writing a business plan and getting sponsors uh, to, to pay for your, your parts and your trips to competitions. So, so it, it's a lot of fun. I've been a part of it for uh, the past five years. And uh, even though that's my last year, which is very sad, I, I know um, that it's an awesome opportunity for anybody who joins in the future. All right, and you won't hurt any feelings. My guess is, is that you probably beat boys teams more often than not, is that true? We, we uh, uh, two years ago, we, we got second in the whole region. So I, I'd say we're, we're pretty good for, uh, against the boys teams, yeah. <laughs> yeah, no, that's really amazing. And can you tell me just a little bit about you teaching some of the younger grades and, and how those students react to it? Yeah, um, so after joining Girls of Steel for about a year, I kind of saw um, that, other girls did not have this sort of experience and that the co-ed robotics programs that were available, even though, they, even though they were open to girls, girls didn't want to join because they had no friends in them. They had no female role models. They had no female teachers. Um, so I, I went to my school and I, through the help of Girls of Steel, I secured um, some funding to start a robotics team for third grade girls. And I taught these six girls and they all want to continue. So over the past four years, it's ballooned into a program about 30 girls over four grades. Um, and it's a really awesome opportunity, especially I feel like when I was younger, I would have loved this. And um, being able to pass down my knowledge, which they respond very well to, and they're all very excited, um, is an awesome opportunity. I know one, one small example is I taught them uh, some coding syntax one day, and then they all went out at recess the next day and spoke in code with semicolons at the end of their sentences. So um, I know that they all they all love it, and I love teaching them. Yeah. So I, I know we all speak in emojis today, so maybe we'll be speaking <laughs> in code in the future. Uh, that will not surprise me at all. Uh, Malik, uh, you grew up wanting to be an inventor, and uh, you first got involved in robotics or robotics competitions. Can you just tell me um, you know, kind of what got started, got you started on this path and, and tell us about your experience. Uh, yeah, sure. So what happened was back in high school, I was, like you said, I was still kind of set up being some type of inventor. So I really had no specific idea of what I wanted to do when I got to college. I knew just that I wanted to do something with science. Then somewhere around my sophomore year of high school, my school got this uh, robotics team started and going, and I thought it'd be a cool opportunity to join. And when I started joining up, we were just getting things rolled up. So I got to see stuff built from the ground up, like how the teams were formed, what kind of the basics of what goes into a robot, where the experience of some of the competitions, got to meet some other people. And all of that is just really good experience if you're trying to look for a way to kind of get into the robotics. The experience of just especially going to robotics competitions and seeing what others do, seeing what problems will, can and will occur during these competitions and how people fix them on the fly and what other people have designed are just really inspiring to kind of see. So then you get cut through a little bit more through high school. I learned exactly what an engineer was. And I figured that, you know, from the description, that sounds like exactly what I want to do. And then after doing a bit of research, I specifically wanted to choose electrical engineering. So with that all being said, I, you know, went to college, specialized in electrical engineering, and then, you know, just graduated my degree. 
So, and, and I would imagine that graduating, and by the way, you went to University of Pittsburgh. So, you know, right here in Pittsburgh, you went to the Swanson School of Engineering. Yes. And, you know, with that education, I imagine you had many career opportunities, right? So it was kind of a foundational uh, start that you had. Yeah, when you, um, when you go into the, uh, an engineering program and you're going to learn about uh, all the aspects of engineering of whatever engineering you want to do, usually what kind of typically happens is that you start with um, your basic classes and learning all the fundamentals of like a bunch of science. So it's a lot of big, heavy science and math classes like physics, and, you know, calculus and all the things like that. Then after that, you start taking more of your basics in whatever field you want to specialize in. So throughout my education, I got this um, this generalized uh, education path of just learning about all the different aspects of electrical engineering, not just specifically anything in robotics, but stuff that can come in handy in like any field, honestly. So when I was just going through all that, I came out with all of these different special skills that came out and how I was going to use them when I graduated, it was all up to pretty much whatever job application came back to me with a yes, which pretty much eventually led to, you know, me applying for RE squared. I yeah. was researching what they could do, saw some of the stuff they were building, thought it was really cool, decided that, you know, I would kind of jump in this field right now. And I'm already like, few, like nine months in and I don't regret it. Yeah, that, that's great. And you're from Philadelphia, is that correct? Uh, yes, I'm from Philadelphia. I just recently moved up here from Philly to Pittsburgh so I can, you know, do my thing. That's great. And of course, you're a Sailor fan, right? <laughs> <laughs> Not really the biggest sports fan out here, but you know. You don't have to answer that. Um, <laughs> but there was a question. Uh, what uh, FRC team were you on, real quick? Uh, which FRC? Uh, my team uh, back at Philly was called E equals MCD. Nice. Real nice. Okay, well, we're going to talk about first in in a little bit. Uh, Don, uh, you know, I, I, my mother wanted me to be a doctor, so I started off in all the science courses. Um, but I actually ended up really grad, you know, you know, being pulled towards you know, kind of the business side of things. I I think I just like talking too much. So you know, not everybody uh, follows that traditional route through college, and and you had a really interesting experience. Um, and, you know, I, I'll, I'll say it for you. You call yourself a dinosaur, but you're actually on the cutting edge uh, in, in the world on machines that move and, and manipulate. And you're actually in the charge of the team of, you know, assembling those and getting them out into the field in a reliable way. H how'd you get to this point? Well, when I, uh, my senior year, computers were just starting out. So you basically had personal computers were like Commodore 64 with a 500k hard drive and a you know phone modems so college wasn't really an option for me so the most technical field you could go into at the time was avionics and the navy had the best avionics program there was uh, a bunch of new airplanes were starting to come out so i signed up for avionics in the navy uh, bunch of tech schools with the Navy. Uh, after about nine years of active duty, I went to the reserves and uh, uh, I actually flew air crew for 15 years and I went around the world doing that while I was working a civilian job. So I've been involved with uh, paging build outs when paging was big. So I, I, I built out paging systems and I was involved with uh, AT&T's 4G build out when they were doing their 4G build out. And then I just came around to robotics kind of by accident. I was looking for a new job and there she goes. Um, <laughs> uh, <laughs> and uh, I am robotics was hiring and uh, robots, robots are a lot like an airplane. They're, they're very detailed integrated system. Uh, you have a lot of independent systems working together to get the job done. And like an airplane, if one thing goes wrong, <laughs> it can ruin your day or, or, but I mean, so 
Yeah, yeah. and and what what a great experience, right? In terms of yeah. working with integrated systems, and and like you said, you know, having to uh, maintain and build airplanes, and and this what's at stake uh, is extremely helpful when we're putting these robots into the field to do things uh, from a reliable standpoint. Yeah, because you're doing a lot of R and D, so it, it's a lot of build it test it okay that's not quite right let's take it apart find out what's not going quite right and then modify it put it back together test it so a lot of patience is involved with that yeah yeah okay well good we'll we'll, we'll get back to some of that um hey tom uh so you received your phd in robotics uh you started a company uh you're you're a ceo um you know and uh, well, actually, before we get to that, um, I'm interested in, in, you know, what it really took to get to that PhD level. And what would you say one key if you could think about it in terms of getting into that to the advanced program path? Yeah, so I think uh, when it comes to getting into any advanced program, um, you know, there's sort of the necessary qualifications, right? You have to have pretty good grades as an undergraduate student, you have to have good test scores on like the uh, standardized test scores. Um, but what they're, what would make somebody compelling or unique is experience in the thing that they're applying for. So as an undergraduate, I did some robotics research, um, you know, for professors. I also did robotics projects on my own. Uh, depending on the university you're at, you may not be able to do research with a professor, but you might still be able to do your own kind of robotics project. So the fact that I had independently done that kind of on my own and partially for fun, partially for, for research experience, I think that's what kind of made it, uh, made my application probably compelling. And, uh, and I want to- lots of people with good grades. Yeah, and, and I want to say that uh, came up before um, in robotics, experiential learning is really critical. Um, yeah. I think Malik had mentioned it and, and Tom, you mentioned it here. Uh, and I know at I am we place a premium on people that would would participate in competitions that took on projects, no matter what, you know, whether in high school or, you know, in the undergrad level. Um, it's very important and that it almost um, was more important, you know, than the uh, than the standard, uh, you know, learning. Yeah, you would agree yeah, with that as well. And, and you're oh, also an entrepreneur. Um, you know, so uh, if anybody here is feeling entrepreneurial and, you know, is interested and, and has ideas and wanted to follow through with that, I, I know that's a topic unto itself, um, mm -hmm. but what, what initial advice could you offer or, or at what point did you know you might run a company? So I, I think the advice that I would offer is that um, listening is actually a very important skill when you're an entrepreneur because what you're trying to do, right? The way you succeed is to serve your customers well. And the way you serve your customers well is by listening to the people who you think will be your customers, finding out what their problems are and then building solutions. And by listening like that, you um, get rid of some of your own ego, right? Like you, you will make mistakes, um, but your customers will tell you about them. By listening, you will learn from your mistakes more quickly and you'll be able to adjust more quickly. And you will be able to maybe let go of maybe an idea that probably wasn't very good to begin with, but, um, you know, but that you were attached to personally, right? So if you, if you can let go of your own ideas and listen to your customers and improve your products based on what they tell you, then you will be successful. Or at least, I mean, you need a little luck too, but it's right. it's an important right. part being successful. I, I think that is excellent advice. I think sometimes we are um, misled uh, by the stories that we know the most, like Steve Jobs, who was a visionary. Uh, what people don't know is that they did tons of market research. Uh, now he might have made his own decisions when seeing that that data, but you do have to listen uh, to what's happening in the marketplace. You you can't just think you know better. Um, yeah. Kyle, real quick, um, you know, so you work with people from traditional industries like manufacturing or, or even energy, you know, and coal, um, you know, from what you know, how do these people actually decide to move over into a new industry? And, 
you know, how difficult is, uh, can that be? Yeah, no, Joel, it's a, it's a great question. So a lot of it is just opportunity based and people seeing um, available positions or, or uh, understanding that there's new opportunities to be had in manufacturing. Um, new technologies like robotics and automation are a- allowing manufacturers to reshore um, some critical industries. We do a lot of work in like the textile and apparel industry, so like sewing clothes and things like that. Um, and robotics actually allow um, some of that work to start coming back to the U.S. Um, what we see with the manufacturers that we work with, and this is getting to the point a lot of people have made about that you don't always need an advanced degree, um, that the biggest need that manufacturers have is really that entry level robotics position. So not necessarily someone with an advanced degree that's doing the um, uh, building the systems and, and doing the programming, but the person that's doing the day-to-day maintenance and troubleshooting um, of, of that equipment. Um, that seems to be the biggest gap that manufacturers have in actually finding skilled people. And again, um, these are folks that maybe participate in, in a couple of week training course, maybe have a community college degree, um, but it doesn't require a, a, you know, a, a four or six year research university type program um, to become employed and to have a high value and, and high paying career. Okay. Yeah, really good. And uh, at the end, we want to offer some direct advice of what people can do if they are following that career path. Uh, So hopefully we can capture that. So um, people came because they're interested in careers in robotics, uh, or maybe somebody wanted to be convinced and now they're convinced. Okay. So we're, we're enamored, you know, with, with uh, the prospect of working in this exciting field, but what does a typical day look like? Uh, so this question kind of goes to Malik, Don, and and Tom. You know, what do you do? Uh, is it as exciting as it seems in the movies? <laughs> uh, Don or Malik? I'm going to let you guys just uh, kind of give us a peek into your typical day. Well, my typical day starts in the morning when I when I see what tasks we have to accomplish for today and uh, who I have and what skills I have to get those tasks accomplished. So I'll, I'll come in early, I'll see what we need to do, I'll assign tasks, and uh, we'll, we'll do the build or test or assemblies, and then I'll do whatever inspections need done, and uh, pretty much go from there. It's, we, we have a build plan for, for today, we have a build plan for the week, and a build plan for the month. And, and you work largely in a manufacturing, I mean, it's assembly, uh, so you're not building core components. Um, but in terms of a complicated integrated system, you, you really are putting the fin- final product together, correct? Yes, I, I, I put the first screw in the first piece of metal and I put the last screw in the last piece of metal <laughs> and then I turned it over to the, uh, to the test department to, uh, to run it through its paces. Very cool. Malik? Right, so my typical day is kind of... Uh, it's a bit mixed because of, you know, the whole COVID-19 pandemic. So my day can mainly be split between two different types of work. There's the work I do at home and the work I do in office. When I'm at home, a lot of that work I do at home is mainly design work and like design prep. So I'll be, I'll get up in the morning and I'll launch my computer. I'll check my emails to see if, you know, anybody, message me anything important or I need to get on something right away or if I need to prepare something for a meeting, things like that. Then I'll pretty much just go through the day either doing stuff like uh, cable design, some circuit board design, um, uh, some other design reviews and some documentation because in, in like the field of engineering and robotics, it's important to like write down everything you do so someone else knows exactly what you're doing so they're not coming back to you to figure out what they need to do. And then there's the um, work I'll do in office. So at the very few times when I have to go into the office and really like go in and do robotics work, that's when I get a lot of the hands-on work done. So when I'm in the office, I'll typically be going into the lab and I'll be either doing some testing on some systems or some of the robotic systems or some boards maybe that need to be tested to see if they're working okay. I'll be doing tests on the whole system to see if like the robotic, the robot will either just move correctly and 
perform all of its duties that it needs to, or I'll be trying to just go through all these different parameters just to see everything's working out right. That, that's really great. I, um, you know, I want to go to another question that we discussed earlier uh, when we met as a, as a panel. Um, anytime you get into something new, you kind of have a preconceived uh, notion of what it's going to be like. Um, or there might be some myths um, that are you know, misunderstood about what working in this field is like. And, and we, I thought we had a really good conversation around it. You know, what were the misconceptions you had and, and what was the reality that you experienced in, in working in this field? And I'd like to pull you into this part too, Anna, because I think you, you had opened your eyes, you know, to the reality of working in robotics. Um, Anna, we'll start with you. What was your experience like? Yeah, um, well, going in, I think I thought that uh, robotics would just be kind of sitting on a computer, just coding all the time or, or just, just machining. Um, but really, whenever I, whenever I got really involved in it, I think I realized pretty quickly that um, it's a lot more than that, that you need to have the sort of teamwork skills to, to work with those around you. And you need to have presentation skills to, um, to talk about your ideas and, and advocate for them. Um, and then there's also a lot of more, more business skills that are involved in robotics as well. Um, like writing, writing proposals for, for what you're about to make um, and all of that kind of stuff. So I think that was a big misconception, but obviously also um, there's misconceptions surrounding identity of who can be in robotics. And I think that was shattered for me pretty quickly with Girls of Steel, but um, for others, they should know that, that anybody can do robotics. You also said to me, it's not just guys sitting around in hoodies coding. Right. <laughs> that's yeah. really how we distinguish ourselves from the digital world. I mean, and that's what I love about it as well. I mean, I am robotics started off literally in a garage. And then our second office, you know, was, you know, that maker space uh, environment. A lot of hardware, a uh, lot, lot of electronics, the desk of a robotics engineer and developer, uh, you know, is to look at it, you know, you know there's a lot going on. Uh, Malik, uh, how about for you? Uh, so I think the biggest misconception, at least for me, is that, you know, I think of a lot of us, especially, that when we first hear about what robots are, we can kind of think of these really wild things that we see on TV and the movies and like scientists in the white lab coats just going around making these wild things that would probably not too far off, but still could, still a little bit out of their own possibility. But when you actually uh, go into a field of robotics, you realize that in a lot of ways, it's kind of more personalized. Like Anna said, a lot of working in robotics is working in teams and being able to talk to people, getting uh, stuff done. There's a lot of writing that can go into robotics, like I said, with documentations. And there's a lot of like, problem solving that you have to do. And I think one of the coolest things that you can do in robotics is that we say robotics engineer, but that can mean a lot of things that you can be working on the electronics, you can be doing like stuff on the more manufacturing side, you can be the controls, you can do the coding, you can do a bunch of, bunch of other things like that. And what's really cool is that all of these different groups have to kind of come together and talk with each other. So a lot of the times it will be a situations where you'll be like, oh, I have this idea to do this thing to make the robot do this, but maybe that doesn't gel with someone else's part exactly in the, in the process. So you two gotta kind of work around each other and find this nice middle compromise. And that takes a lot of like good communication skills and good team working effort to do. That's great. Uh, Tom or Kyle, did, did you have any thoughts you wanted to add? Uh, on that misconceptions, um, perception versus reality of working in robotics? Well, I will say nobody wears lab coats. <laughs> Definitely. <laughs> I've never been in a single robotics lab where-, where It's a little robotics. disappointing. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, sorry. Actually, when, when I got my PhD, the Robotics Institute parting gift as a gag gift was a lab coat. Like that was like what they gave you when you got your PhD, Just hilarious. I've not worn it since, but I like it. Halloween ones. Um, yeah, that's all I wanted to add, <laughs> Kyle. Yeah, and um, Joel, just going back to your original point, I, I think a misconception I had going in was that everyone was very technical. Um, and at the end of the day, these are companies 
and companies require a diverse set of skill sets. And so there's business development departments, marketing departments, sales, um, you name it. I'm one of those people that doesn't have a technical degree, um, but found my way into a career in robotics. Yeah, um, in, in very early stage companies, you know, like where Tom was and, and even in smaller companies, uh, you are the engineer, uh, you have to assemble the product, but you also have to talk to the customer. Not all engineers like to talk to customers. So you have to find people that like uh, having those conversations and, and building that rapport in the marketplace. And documentation is really important. So project management to help scale your business, to be organized. I mean, if you're an extremely organized person and you work well in integrated teams, uh, there are going to be good opportunities you know, for that. Uh, I'll share one misconception you know, for what it's worth. Um, in selling robots into the marketplace. Um, sometimes people think it's, it's just enough to wow people with a technology or an application. And part of the problem is, is it gets you in the door with customers. But at the end of the day, when you get past that novelty of your solution, it, it still has to perform a useful job. Um, it, it has to be economical. It has to pay for itself this sold return on investment you know, concept. So while we're still in the early stage of robotics, um, we have to build a business around them. Uh, and just like they had to in building dish and in, in selling dishwashers and, and building out that marketplace. So we're still in the really, really early stage. And, and Kyle, I'll echo what you said, which is, is that there are lots of opportunities in, in many different uh, roles. Um, before we, we leave and, and um, let's see where we are in time. I think we have a few extra minutes. Um, I want to make sure that we get to this because I think it's hugely important. Um, you know, rapidly, uh, there is no traditional way of getting into a technology field. Um, you, you can get hands on training in the military. Uh, you can come from another industry. Um, you, you could have a classical, you know, training and be very good at communication and add a lot of value in this field. But it's still true, unfortunately, that others face more challenges, uh, you know, than the majority. And so, you know, I do want to talk to Anna, Malik, and Don, um, and really say, you know, did you face any early challenges um, in in a in a tech industry that is still um, monolithic, kind of from a from a demographics perspective? And what encouraging words do you have for someone who you know wants to take that first step? Uh, or where they might be able to get some help. So I'd like to start with, uh, how about you, Anna? Yeah, um, well, I think I was very, I was very lucky with, a, as compared to a lot of girls who are interested in STEM because I found a place where I saw only people who were like me. I is filled with girls with similar interests to me, but I know that a lot of, a lot of girls who see themselves interested in, in robotics or in computer science or anything like that, uh, don't really know where to what to do because they aren't very interested in joining the existing programs that they feel very outnumbered in. Um, and to that, I would say to to stick with it because even if you don't have a very strong community right now, you will in the future. There's Society of Women Engineers in college. There's um, women in computer science groups. Um, but personally, I think the biggest challenge I had even on an all girls robotics team is that feeling of imposter syndrome. When I went into a, when I went into a space where I knew that I was a sophomore and there was a senior there, or even when somebody came across as really confident as if they knew everything, even if they didn't, I immediately felt like I knew significantly less. Um, so I think it took me a while to, to challenge those thoughts and to kind of really, um, push past that and gain the confidence. And I think you do that by, by diving into it, even if you feel uncomfortable and even if you feel outnumbered or unrepresented to really be the representation or, or just put yourself into a space that, that will give you the exposure and the experience you need to develop confidence and the skills that, that will help you in your future when you do become a STEM professional. Very uh, great advice and uh, very inspirational. And you know, for someone who's been going through that you know, during your high school education, uh, that is really meaningful. So thank you very much, uh, Malik. So I would say uh, one of the biggest hurdles I would say facing me when I was going through this whole technical education to where I am now would be when I started college. When I 
began the engineering program my freshman year, it really, really, really kicked my butt, honestly. Like, to a very, very bad degree, it was not good. And a lot of that stemmed from the fact that in high school, I, I did pretty well. You got a lot of you know, pretty good grades, but in using high school, you don't have to put as much effort into understanding the material as you have to do in college. In college, they give you so much and you have all this information to you that you can easily get confused. And if you don't understand it, it can just leave you behind. And one of those early things that I had a struggle with is that I didn't want to look for help or get a support. I had this idea that I could do it on my own. And if I had to really tell anyone who's really be interested in getting into robotics or getting into engineering or getting into science or anything like that, I would say if you're having trouble in the beginning, don't ask for help. Don't worry about not asking for help. Ask for help from anybody, professors, from teachers, build a network, and especially because of the problem if you're like a person like me who um, is like this uh, a black person in the uh, technical industry, especially where I know it can be hard to like kind of get like the education you need to kind of maybe want to succeed or even if you have trouble like finding people again who look like you in this field but there are you know people that look like you in this field there's actually um a lot of engineering colleges will have this thing called NSBE which is the National Society of Black Engineers and if you kind of like hook up with them and join them you can learn like about all of these different people who look like you doing all of these different jobs and everything so really, honestly, ask for help, do, your, do the work. Don't be afraid to talk to people, honestly. Um, or even if you're like me, where I kind of have this problem where it takes me a lot longer to really understand something, something before I actually get it down to memory. And that's really because I've learned from, you know, doing the entire engineering education that I'm more of a person who likes to, doesn't consider something learned until I understand every aspect of it, which after a while, you know, can kind of become impossible as you go through your education. So another thing would be just to learn to pick and choose your battles and anything you don't understand, you'll probably understand later. A lot of the stuff that can be taught earlier on gets repeated over and over and over again. So eventually you start to get it. And again, if all else fails, the internet, YouTube, it's a fantastic source to be learning about anything you want to know about anything. So I ended up using YouTube a lot and the internet a lot when I didn't understand something or I wanted to learn something more about this career and everything. So really the whole point is to reach out, network, talk to people, get help whenever you need to. Yeah, I'll echo a small common thread between both of your comments is to uh, speak up, you know, uh, have that confident voice, uh, very talented. Uh, very creative and a great opportunity to add value. And, uh, you know, the industry has a long way to go uh, to solving our diversity issues. But I think in, uh, you know, in Pittsburgh, the community is interested in how we build those bridges. So I'm really happy to, you know, to hear your experiences from both of you. And Dawn, you know, you, you faced some challenges as well. And, uh, you know, you were able to offer some insights. Would you share those with the group? Well, Coming in from aviation, um, aviation is uh, pretty detail oriented, documentation heavy and very detail, attention to detail. Um, so it wasn't that difficult switching over to robotics. It was just uh, seeing how all, all the systems tie together and how you have to work with a lot of other teams. You're working with the engineers, you're working with the programmers. Uh, you're working with a bunch of other people in a tight, tight area because there you don't have a lot of area to work on the plane, yeah, on the robots compared to a plane. So I would say, you know, if you're not sure of something, don't be afraid to ask questions. Um, you know, Don, when, when you went to the military, I imagine they didn't ease you in. They probably <laughs> threw you into things and, and you have followed this kind of circuitous route you know, to be here. And you talked quite a bit about persistence, right? Did you ever feel like quitting through any of that? Oh, every once in a while, you'll, you'll hear the wall where you, you go, do I really want to keep doing this? Or, 
or not. And uh, I'm not a, I, I don't quit on anything. I, I just press on. If, if I don't know something, I'll ask people. I'll, I'll do whatever reading I have to do. Uh, but for the most part, there's a lot of people out there that will help you. They'll talk to you, uh, help guide you through the, the difficult parts. So don't be afraid to ask people for help. Don't be afraid to ask questions. Uh, like I tell the guys I work with, it's like, if you're not sure of something, you haven't done it before, don't be afraid to tell me. I'll, you know, I'll come over and show you. I'll give you a refresher. Uh, let's do it right the first time. <laughs> so we'll have to do it again. Uh, yeah, no, that that's great. I mean, don't, don't quit. And, uh, yeah. and I think that's you fine. said earlier, I, and, uh, you know, if you said it again, I apologize, but you said, um, you know, show up to work uh, looking to, to do something. Uh, to be proactive in, in solving problems. And I, I think that's really important. Yeah, prob problem solving is a big thing, but being able to think out of the side, outside of the box because uh, a lot of things just can't be uh, approached from a logical point of view sometimes. Right. And if, if you're done doing whatever you were assigned, don't be afraid to come up and say, hey, uh, I'm done with that. Is there something else I can help you with? Okay, so um, I want to move into the last section uh, with the time that we have remaining. And it's really about, all right, I want to work in robotics. Uh, so what do I need to be doing? Uh, what do I need to do and what's important? I, I want to make sure the audience, if you haven't already looked at the chat, there's been some really great questions and some good information that's already been provided. And I thank everybody for the questions and also for uh, the responses. Really great question uh, from Jasmine Chang about trainings or courses for entry level uh, robotics and technician work. And thank you, Bill, for mentioning that uh, Cal U and CCAC both have mechatronics disease uh, uh, degrees. And, uh, and I see the folks from Bots IQ here in the audience as well. And uh, yeah, they, they have a state registered robotics technician uh, pre-apprenticeship program. And in fact, we've, we're just starting conversations with them. So we're, we're interested to learn more and, and to see how we, we can promote that. Um, so there's some links in the chat. Um, and then uh, Jen from uh, the Pittsburgh Robotics Network had uh, noticed that, uh, had mentioned that New Century Careers also, also offers some programs. We're gonna look to get an email out to everybody. And then as, as a PRN, uh, starts ramping up a little bit more as well. We'll have a lot of these resources. I, if I forget, I want to mention it now. Anybody can contact us at info at pgh, uh, robopgh.org. Uh, so info at robopgh.org. Uh, and I'll, I'll have Jen make sure she puts that into the, the chat. We want to be uh, a resource for trying to help people. So to the panel, what do they need? What do people need to be doing? So Anna, you're, you're a senior in high school, but if we might have some high school students uh, in, the, in the audience today, what classes should they be taking? Um, yeah, so I would say you, as a high school student, you should take as many STEM classes as you, as you uh, are able to take. Um, not forgetting about the, the other very important subjects because I think it's great to have the combination of um, all types of knowledge. Um, but I, I think really trying all of the different types of STEM is, is very important. I know personally, um, I, I've taken all of the advanced or science classes that my school can pretty much give me. And I've found that I don't love physics, but I love advanced math. So now I'm looking more towards data science over robotics, um, or different career paths like that. So that can really be eye-opening. And then of course, become as involved as you can outside of the classroom in organizations uh, like robotics teams or STEM clubs or programming clubs or whatever's available. So we talked about Girls of Steel a little bit and um, you know, it, uh, it, it, it uh, can be competitive uh, to get into that. However, we do encourage people. Um, how, would, how would they get involved in Girls of Steel? Yeah, um, I, I bet uh, Terry Richards here, who's one of the amazing mentors on Girls of Steel, uh, can can pop some sort of link in in the chat. But uh, there is an application; it's brief uh, to to join any of the Girls of Steel programs. But I know that if if you're a boy looking to become involved in robotics, that or just a girl who's who's unsure, can't really get to where Girls of Steel meets at Carnegie Mellon, there are a lot of opportunities. Um, Sarah Hines House has a robotics team. Um, I know a lot of Pittsburgh public schools have robotics teams and there will be so many more coming up. Um, 
really, you can look on uh, firstinspires.org and kind of search your location. I believe there's a way to see what's around you. Okay, really great. So we really encourage um, you know students um, to look at those organizations and, and try to get involved. And, and to community members here in the audience as well, we want to create more of these opportunities in Pittsburgh. So if we can find ways to collaborate, partner, and find some sources of funding, there need to be more Girls of uh, Steel uh, teams. We'd like to uh, create some teams similar to that for other underserved uh, groups. Uh, so I think it's just an incredible opportunity. And uh, Terry, I'm looking at you. I'd like to follow up and have a conversation about that. Uh, you've created a wonderful model. Uh, and Patty wrote as well, uh, who's on the board of the Pittsburgh Robotics uh, Network. Um, Tom, uh, you know, just real quick, um, the skills that you think are important uh, at an early stage or, or even as you're starting to go through school that are important on developing? I'm going to be hopefully not too vague with this answer, but I feel like the most important thing, the most important skill is to learn, you know, something on your own. Like how do you, to, to be capable of facing a problem right? And coming up with a solution uh, and figuring out that path um, kind of on your own. Now, on your own doesn't mean you don't, that part of that path isn't asking for advice or getting help from others. Um, but it's just being able to, um, yeah, to learn um, without a formal structure in place. And the reason that I say that and the way that I feel like you actually build that skill is by doing projects, right? By, by looking at problems that are that you don't know how to solve and thinking, okay, how can I solve this? How can I make a solution? And this is general advice. This, is, this applies really well to robotics because a lot of robotics problems right now are ill-defined and the solutions, nobody actually knows how to, how to solve them yet. Um, but I think it, it it is a general kind of engineering mindset that that if you can learn how to learn uh, and learn on your own, um, you can pretty much do anything. Um, so again, my advice is to seek out projects, uh, whether that's in school, after school. And I think FIRST is actually a great example of that as a place where they give you kind of a, a problem to solve. And most people on the team don't know how to solve that at the beginning of the, the competition and you kind of figure it out together. Um, so yeah, that, that would be my advice. It'd be okay. to look for projects where you're learning and where you are being forced to learn on your own to some extent. Okay. Thank you. Dawn, I, I wanted to make sure we covered college isn't for everyone um, and that's okay. Or students may not have the grades uh, currently and, or necessarily have the same opportunities to access uh, the pathways, you know, in, in the industry. Um, you know, you've proved, uh, again, working for one of these cutting edge, uh, you know, companies, um, you know, that there is, you know, uh, many opportunities. Uh, what advice can you provide? Um, from a military uh, training point of view, uh, the military has a lot of education programs out there. Their, their technical schools, basic electricity and electronic schools are, are very good. They'll teach you the basics plus and, and get you down into the, the basics of uh, following schematics and, and wiring diagrams. But also on the civilian side, you've got the GI Bill. Uh, the Pennsylvania Guard has some really good programs for getting you uh, college. They have tuition assistance. They've got the the state has its own version of the GI Bill. So we have a lot of the young airmen coming into the base. They join for six years and they're managed to do their college through the, through the military and through the support systems of the military and have a degree in four years or less. So there's, there's a lot of good, good college help from the state and the military. Okay, and I think that's a great segue to Kyle. You know, Kyle, you're working in that economic development space. <clears throat> you know, you work with the Department of Defense um, and probably state and federal level government. And you're, you're working with uh, workforce that's either coming from a traditional industrial background, uh, perhaps going through a change in career uh, or students that are looking to get into manufacturing robotics. 
Um, you, you mentioned some things before, but can you just provide again uh, or some more advice on, on what students or existing workers um, can do to get into high-tech manufacturing and robotics? Yeah, of course. Uh, thanks, Joel. Um, so I guess two quick things, just to echo everyone else's comments, uh, a piece of practical advice that I always feel is really overlooked is when you do land that interview uh, with the startup or with the manufacturer, with the employer, do your homework about what they do and come in with a, a passion and enthusiasm and an understanding of uh, some of the goals and the initiative for that organization. It can really help set yourself apart um, and compensate sometimes too, if you don't feel necessarily like you have um, the right skill set or your concern going into that interview, um, really understanding what that company does, um, because that's why people get into these job fields and that's why people join startups is because they're passionate about the work. Um, one of the things that ARM's doing to try to help facilitate um, and expose people to new career pathways is we're actually launching a site um, in, in three weeks um, we're very excited about it. It's called roboticscareer.org. Um, and so it's an online inventory and database of training programs across the country. Okay. Um, so if you're interested in getting into a career in robotics, that can be a really good resource to understanding what's happening locally. Um, we're set to launch that, like I think on the 25th of March with 10,000 programs across the country. And these are, you know, uh, quick two week boot camps to four year degree programs and everything in between. Um, so that can be a really good resource to, to look look to, uh, forward to. Yeah, great. And uh, you reminded me of something as well. Uh, there's this there's this thing called soft skills, right? And um, you could be the best engineer, you could be the best in your functional area, but uh, those those interpersonal those basic human skills are so so important. So um, listen to your mother, listen to your parents. Uh, they're, well, they're telling you what they're telling you for a reason. Uh, it is important. At the end of the day, you know, we, uh, you know, we have to work in teams. Uh, we work on very difficult problems. And uh, you know, it's, it's helpful for us to, to be able to, uh, to use those soft skills um, you know, to continue um, you know, making progress. So we have covered uh, a lot of um, different perspectives, uh, different pathways into the robotics uh, field. Uh, we've only given you a small introduction into the and in the fact that this is all happening in our backyard uh, in Pittsburgh. Um, we talked about the first robotics competition teams or, or known as FRC teams. Um, there are some of those teams that are available within the Pittsburgh Public Schools. Uh, it was also mentioned that the Sarah, Sarah Hines House um, has a co-ed team that's available. Uh, Girls of Steel uh, is an opportunity, and we posted the link you know, in the chat there. New Century Careers. I mean, Pittsburgh has a, a lot of opportunities. It's a lot to take in. If you remember anything else, contact us at the Pittsburgh Robotics Network and we'll help you out. Um, if you're a teacher or an educator, I've already in advance of this had had some schools that have reached out and we've looked for opportunities um, to be able to um, expose more people to these resources and make sure that anybody that wants to have a career uh, in this space has an opportunity to do so. Um, so we do have a Q and A period. Uh, it's a little bit after seven, we've got about 25 minutes left. Um, I want to see what questions we have. Is there anybody who wants to raise their hand and ask a question? To, uh, to, my, eight, you know, to my students that are here and, and people that are looking for jobs, this is an excellent opportunity to, uh, to get yourself noticed uh, in front of this group. We had a question from um, Rios. Uh, he had asked in the chat earlier, about important facts about robotics. I was going to turn your mic on, ask you to unmute, maybe you could elaborate what kind of facts you were looking for, um, what, what, what specifically you wanted to, to know. Reyes, are you still here? There you go. Yeah, I'm still here. Um, I'm new to like robotics. I'm trying to get, a, I'm trying to, get to learn a little bit more about it. And um, I just wanted to know like a couple of things about it. Because I don't know, I don't know anything about it. What What are a couple of things you'd like to know? What What are you curious about? Um, 
Rios, what, uh, may I ask what grade are you in? Sixth. Well, Anna, maybe you can uh, talk to us a little bit about how you speak the, robo uh, the robotics um, robotics concepts, you know, to the sixth grade. Well, can you say that again? Well, so Rios is in sixth grade. He's he's really new uh, to robotics. That you know, maybe a lot of us sometimes we face something that we don't even know. You know, what questions we don't know. So, you know, how, how, what kind of conversations do you have, you know, uh, with sixth graders about robotics, and, and what are some of the questions that they are asking you? Well, I, I, I don't know anything about this, and I'm trying to get to know about it. And I don't know what questions to ask. Yeah, exactly. So I'm asking the question of Anna, uh, who does work with a number of uh, middle school uh, kids. Anna, maybe you can help us out. Anna, are Absolutely, you yeah. There you go. Sorry. <laughs> um, yes, I I think robotics is is definitely daunting, especially when when you're when you're younger, looking looking at it, and people are saying even just like a five hundred gig system or or something like that. You're you're kind of just like what what does any of that mean? Um, but I think you can start you can start to answer your questions about certain aspects by. But as Malik said, there's tons of resources online. You can even, if you want to get an introduction to coding, um, khanacademy.org has a, uh, a really great, great coding lesson there. But, but I think um, a lot of times, as we spoke of earlier, there's a lot of preconceived notions over what a robot is or what a robot could be. Um, and I think what I tend to say to, to sixth graders is, is that a robot, um, you have one with your phone and the device that you're on. So you could be a sort of computer engineer in that sense, but you could also look at, uh, I don't even know, like Boston Dynamics has, has walking, walking robots that, that are really cool. So, so I, don't, I don't exactly um, know of a fact off the top of my head, but I think if you're, if you're feeling totally in the dark and, and you're kind of wondering how, how to get into this, um, just do some research online, look up even just like cool robots. You'll, you'll get a bunch of pictures and then you can look up how does this work from the picture that you think is interesting. Yeah. Sorry, I couldn't be more helpful. <laughs> Rios, Rios, check the chat. Um, we actually had another website that was posted, www.botsiqpa.org. Um, I haven't checked out this exact link uh, recently, but uh, maybe uh, Maria, uh, I see you. I know one of your colleagues was here as well. Um, I, I welcome anybody from the audience to chime in as well. If they have anything that they want to add, uh, you can just ask to unmute. And uh, Tom, you also deal you know, with a lot of primary and secondary education you know, about robotics. Um, do please go check out Bird Brain Technologies. Uh, the kit is really amazing, uh, you know, in terms of showing, um, you know, actuators and, uh, you know, other devices that, you know, you really can manipulate in a way. I, the most amazing thing, it was just cardboard and uh, you can get as creative as possible um, and, and to be able to create your own robot. But Tom, I don't know if you have anything you wanted to add. Yeah, I do actually. So um, since the pandemic, one of the things we've been playing around with is this idea of uh, remote robots, which are robots that you can program over the internet. So Rios, I'm going to drop a link into the chat for everybody, but it's it's a web page with um, videos, live streams of five robots that are in my house. And if you click through to those, you can actually program them with uh, blocks programming language. And there are tutorials and things to help help you out to some extent also. Um, so yeah, so that, that may be a way for you to, to get a sense of what it would be like to program a robot, even though that robot is, is you know, remote or it's at, it's at my house, you can see it through the, uh, through the camera. Um, so yeah. You know, I, I wanted to add, thanks a lot for that, Tom. Yeah, we'll look forward to seeing that. And Rio, so I, I would say another thing too, um, I think there might be advantage to not knowing much about robotics and robots. Um, up until this point, you know, we've had folks that follow a traditional academic career. They're, they are tackling very difficult fields of research and, and development. 
And then they go out in the industry and they say, oh, well, you know, we can have a robot that will check us out at the grocery line and we can have a robot that will, you know, pick items in a, uh, you know, in a, in a warehouse. I, I think having uh, a new perspective on this, you might be one who can come up with entirely new ways that we can't even imagine of how these machines are going to impact our lives. And I think that's really, really important. And, you know, it's been discussed many, many times that no one could have envisioned the iPhone. Um, and, and with every major technical innovation, you know, there's a famous story with uh, the introduction of the automobile. Uh, you know, it's a, it's a famous Henry Ford quote. You know, if he would ask his customers what they wanted in an automobile, they would have said a faster horse, right? So it's very hard for us to envision what our future is going to be like. So Rios, I, I encourage you to be creative. Think about how machines uh, can interact with us and, and help us in every day. And then follow one of these, uh, these pathways to, to try to start building your understanding. Jen, do we have other questions? Well, the chat's been pretty active, I think with a lot of great resources and um, I'm not seeing any direct questions here right now. Um, All right. Well, I, um, I, I'm sorry, Jen, I didn't know if you had anything else, but I, um, I did have one more topic we could go back to and just give people a couple more moments to think about a question. Oh, Rios has another question here. I'll go ahead and unmute him, see if he can elaborate. If he's given a little more thought, it has uh, something right. popped, popped in his mind. Let's do it. Um, what's something hard and interesting about working in robotics? Great question. Who from the panel wants to take that? Uh, I'll give it a shot. So I would say that something that is both hard and interesting about the robotic about robotics is that problem solving element of robotics, really. So just being able to like have a problem in front of you and go, okay, how can we use a robot to solve this? Can we have it do this, that, and third? And thinking how to do that can be really hard and really challenging because you have a lot of restrictions in that regard, but it can also be really fun when you finally get an idea, put it all together and see it working. So it becomes really satisfying when you finally get to that final step. Yeah, and just seconding that, I think um, it's a, my favorite, one of my favorite parts about robotics on the more educational level, I guess, is, is how um, is how when you get a, a challenge, I guess, and I know that the ones I face in robotics are are more like, uh, how do you climb a rope that's hanging off the ceiling versus how do you uh, wash dishes or whatnot. But um, I think what's really great is that your first and hard, is that your first try at something is, is never the one that ends up being the final one or very rarely is. Um, and so it was a lot of fun, I know, um, with that challenge a few years ago, we were told that um, the robot had to climb up a rope and hang there for around five seconds. And that was, I mean, how can you get a 120 pound thing to go up a rope? Um, so it was a lot of fun to try to make a sort of system with teeth that could grab in and knot the rope around itself. Um, but we went through so many iterations of that and so many prototypes. And I think it was a lot of fun by the end, holding up this metal piece that was fully put together and fully functional with the wooden falling apart first try. Um, it's tough and it's long, but it, I think it's a lot of fun. Uh, Anna, I also want, um, we talked about, you know, in our prep meeting uh, about making mistakes in developing robots. Yes. Yeah, there, there is a lot of that, especially on a, on a high school team. Um, it, as I said, your, your first try is really never, never the one that you end up with. And sometimes even the one you end up with isn't fully, fully functional. I know on Girls of Steel and in first robotics in general, most teams go to two competitions a year. And uh, usually at our first competition, something will go drastically wrong and, and things will be falling apart and rope over. I know one year we were, uh, we were getting 
the robot was on the field and it just started smoking and there was smoke everywhere. And by the second competition, we had fixed it. We had figured it out. And, and even though a mistake was made originally, we ended up being really successful at our second attempt. So, so yeah, never get discouraged by the first mistake because it can always become better and it will always uh, fix in the end. No, that's really great. Um, I see a question uh, from Craig Campbell. Hello, Craig. Uh, good to see you. Thanks for the question. Uh, it's to me, uh, it's about uh, the business side of selling and convincing uh, mainline industries to adopt uh, robots. I think first, fundamentally, anything in sales is making sure you understand a customer's problem. Um, robot, robotics uh, technologies um, are typically um, still more often not guilty of a solution trying to find a problem. And that's just because there's been a lot of basic research in developing these amazing capabilities. And I think the other challenge is, is that a lot of these robotic platforms can be used in so many different applications. The one advice I give to uh, very early stage technical founders is make sure you're passionate about the industry that you're going into. It, it's, a, it's a lot of fun. There's a lot of great uh, research and discovery in building your solution. But if you're ultimately selling a robot that's doing uh, pipe remediation for sewers, you, you better love talking to municipalities. You better love talking to city personnel. You better love climbing down into a sewer well and getting involved in their business. So you have to really understand their problems. Um, you have to build close relationship uh, with your customers. The other thing I'll add, since Craig, you mentioned, um, you know, old school manufacturing industries, you can get in the door with an exciting new innovation, but it's all about the economics. And Don, I tip my hat to uh, our friend Tom at I am, uh, you know, he really understood that. And uh, you, you have to, it, it ends up coming down to a, what's called a return on investment. That solution that they buy has to earn some kind of return within a one to three year time frame. So we can get really enamored with selling this innovation, which I've always enjoyed doing, uh, but you have to truly solve a problem and it has to be able to pay for itself. So there was another question about robotic internships. Are there any available? Um, and, and are they in person? Some have been shutting down. Malik, uh, you met, you have responded to this. You might be able to speak to RE squared and, and Tom, you might have some insights to internships as well. I, I can speak to, you know, the, the general membership of the PRN. Yes, there are internships. They are looking for summer internships. A lot of them classically go through the universities. Um, don't feel shy about reaching out to companies. Uh, you know, in the Pittsburgh area and tell your story, um, be able to express, you know, your interest so you can get that first conversation. But Malik, do you want to talk a little bit about uh, the internship, pro internship program at RE Squared? Yes. So I believe uh, right now we are looking for interns for the summer. I believe that um, we're just right now looking for an electrical engineering intern at the moment. And the way RE Squared's uh, internship programs usually kind of work is that it's not publicly available on our website. You probably have to contact um, uh, us directly to someone at the company. So if anyone might be potentially interested in looking at the um, internships at RE Squared or discussing it more, you can probably uh, shoot me an email if you would like. I can put it in the chat if anyone wants. And I can see um, maybe if there's anything out there that I can help you all out with. Okay, and I can also say, Don, at I am, um, we would have a handful of high school students uh, that would actually uh, work with us during a summer period as interns. Yes, we we have uh, we do have internships available right now. They're on the website iamrobotics.com. Uh, I think we're looking for interns in about three areas right now. Uh, assembly is one of them. <laughs> so uh, I know that that is open right now. We're, we're, we're looking at the applications for that this week. And I think a couple of the areas, uh, I don't know off the top of my head right now, but just 
head to the website and see what we have available for internships. I was also okay. going to share, Joel, I'm okay. going to share the, the link for the Pittsburgh Robotics Network has a list of companies, uh, robotics companies here in the area. So uh, if you're a little overwhelmed by, think, by wondering, geez, I don't know the name of every single robotics company in the area to search them one by one for internships. Uh, here's a nice list. There are some hyperlinks embedded in there as well. And that list should help you get started uh, figuring out what companies to look into and which ones to target. There's another question. Everybody's warming up. So I really appreciate the questions. Are there opportunities for us as roboticists uh, to help specifically in the Hazelwood community, mentoring, volunteering? Um, what I would say is, why don't you contact us and uh, we will put you in touch with the Hazelwood uh, local group. Um, we're just starting to develop that relationship with them. And uh, we'd love to you know, make the, uh, the introduction. Kyle, I don't know if you also have some direct links or thoughts on that too. No, uh, um, Joel, just to add to you, um, Gabriel, thank you for that question. I, I, I grabbed your email. I'm gonna respond to, to your note. Um, there's uh, a, a lot more I think that ARM can be doing um, and we're meeting um, with, with the Center of Life actually tomorrow to talk about that. Um, and so it's great to have your information and, and include you in some of those conversations as those progress. All right, what other questions we have? I had to turn off my video. Again, not being an engineer, I'm about down to 5% battery. So I had to get my, uh, <laughs> my power cord. So leave it to the sales guy. Um, again, keep looking into the chat. Uh, there's a lot of great information and uh, Jen and I will, uh, we, will sum we will gather all this information and summarize it and uh, we'll send an email back out to everybody. Um, really appreciate uh, the level of engagement you know, that we've had. Jen, are there other questions? We do have a question here about how the work from home, you know, sort of virtual world that we're all living in and that this event virtually is a testament to um, how that's affecting the robotics industry and if things like virtual reality and augmented reality um, is being are being implemented to help technicians remotely maintain and, and, and troubleshoot uh, some of the physical hardware. Uh, Malik, uh, Don, yeah. I think both of you could uh, answer that question. Yeah, I was gonna say, um... In terms for how uh, RE squared has changed for the pandemic, uh, a lot of it, like, we, like I said, my work is split between work from home and work at work. Since I'm uh, just a general electrical engineer uh, and some of my tasks are kind of like more of the design level, I'm usually kind of working from home depending on what time frame of the project we're on. But you'll have guys like our shop workers and our technicians who are actually have to go in the office and have to go physically test these things. So a lot of our policies for who can be in the office really has changed for the COVID-19. So for example, uh, our main policy is that if you don't have to be there doing stuff for like out of the robotic arms or doing tests or anything like that, anything that does not physically require you to be there, don't be there. So that kind of mitigates the risk of having a bunch of people just spread around this office and, you know, potentially making things a health risk. Don? Yeah, so we, we never really stopped building when the lockdown started. I actually put a plan together for myself and the other technicians to build cables and sub-assemblies from home. I ended up making a lot of deliveries and pickups from the guys. And once, uh, once things were lifted or but even before things were lifted, we were doing either single person or two people just staying separated in the shop and, and doing what we could. And then uh, I actually had to go to the Netherlands for a robot deployment. We, uh, we deployed 12 robots to the Netherlands. So November, I was going to the Netherlands and they weren't letting anyone in. Uh, we had to have special clearance from the embassy to go there and so you had to spend 10 days in quarantine and then you got to work in their in their warehouse i was there for about 35 days and then came back and went into quarantine uh we we've kept some pretty good tight tolerant uh policies in the in the office so far we have had no no one spread anything 
throughout our building. Uh, we've been pretty lucky. Everyone's keeping surfaces and, and everything clean. We work, work gloves. All the technicians have their own set of tools. So we're not sharing each other's tools. Uh, so we, we've been pretty fortunate. Yeah, I, I think like many companies, robotics companies had to stop for a second, figure out how to, um, you know, work within these restrictions and then ultimately work pick back up and, and a lot of the companies I've spoken to, you know, have adapted through all of this. Um, there are some people that are doing, you know, uh, assemblies at their kitchen tables at home. And I've seen some pictures of that. Uh, so, you know, it's a very, uh, robotics companies are very industrious, uh, and they're very inventive. Um, I want to make sure I acknowledge, uh, Stephen Diamond. Hi, if you, uh, wave there, if some people can see you, I appreciate you reaching out. He's a cyber intelligence analyst in Northern Virginia, seven year Navy veteran coming back to Pittsburgh, and he's interested in opportunities. I asked him to post his email. If, uh, that speaks out to anybody, uh, please feel free to contact him and, and uh, Stephen, you can uh, re even reach out to me. And I'll, I will say for all of our attendees um, who are learning about robotics, um, perhaps graduating and looking for opportunities or, or changing fields, uh, you can contact us again at uh, uh, info at robopgh.org. Uh, Kyle is a great uh, resource as well over at ARM, um, but uh, please, please don't be shy. Um, let's hey, see. Joe. Yes. We've got a question from Terry. I'm going to unmute uh, Terry so that uh, we can get the question. You can unmute yourself now. Go ahead, Terry. Hello. Hello. Hi, everybody. Um, my question well, this is very interesting to me. I do have a nonprofit in Hazelwood, but I wanted to know if the Center of Life um, uh, meeting tomorrow is it open or is it just for Center of Life? Oh, I'm sorry, Terry. I'm just chatting with um, with Joy to talk a little bit about some of the programming things and some events that they have coming up. Okay. Um, but uh, I'd be happy to chat with you separately. I'm, I, sure, I'll that'd send be great. I'll down in the chat. That'd be great. Thank you. Yeah, of course. Thank you, Terry. Terry, how, how was this? Um, I mean, some people asked on how they could potentially volunteer in Hazelwood and, and continue to strengthen some of these connections? Do you have any ideas about that? Um, the, the connection is to be in these meetings. Um, uh, if I can get like information sent to me where I can distribute it because I am also the chair of the Greater Hazelwood Community Collaborative. So I can share that information to get people maybe to join in on the meetings that, because this is necessary, it's needed. Um, I'm an old school, but I still would like to, because I have programming for teens on Thursdays and maybe some adults want to know about it, but I do have programming. So that would be something that the individual grassroots organization or organizations period would need to know about. So if you can send me something, I can send it to the full GACC and that's 40 organizations that can pick and choose whether they want to be in these meetings, but they need to be in these meetings. Well, why don't we connect with you afterwards so we can make sure that we're sending the right information in the right way. And then, okay. you know, we, we can do that. There are other organizations here today too um, that I think, uh, you know, offer, you know, lots of value. It, it reminds me of my conversation um, with Pastor Tim, you know, and he talked about how important communication is. It is. You know, we, we take it for granted and some of us are already kind of tuned in with our radars or at least we're already um you know in touch you know with the right resources but there's so many of us that are not right and and so communication is the first challenge he also said something else too which is um and and i i agree with this wholly we've been talking about things about how much opportunity there there, are, there is how many resources there are um how this how this industry is going to grow i i don't want to give the impression that it's easy right Right. Because, you know, you know, Anna uh, and Don and Malik, you know, just even in, in the pathways that they have followed, just getting into the industry, even when you have all of the advantages, this is a difficult thing to do. Um, so uh, but I, I go to Don's message of don't don't quit, be persistent. And Anna, you know, in terms of have your voice and, and have that confidence. Um, you know, and continue and and look, like Malik said, you know, find those 
those organizations that are sharing those same challenges and they're coming together. Um, and we'll, we'll chip away at this. And I agree, we, we just need to do more of it. There's no magic solution. Right, communication and consistency is the key. Exactly. All right, well, we're at 7.30. Uh, Jen, you think we're good? Yeah, I think we've gotten through most of the questions. I think um, Rios uh, was really surprised to hear that people are still able to work in robotics during COVID. I think Malik talked a little bit about that with the addressing the question before, but Malik, how much back in the office are you? Are you, uh, same with Don, are you guys in the office every day? Or are you doing these Zoom meetings too? A little combo of both, right? Well, right now, uh, so it's kind of interesting. When I first, uh, you know, joined RE Squared, I was still in Philadelphia. So a lot of it was just, you know, the online Teams meetings and Google Meets and everything like that. Then a little later on into one of the projects I was working on, I started coming to the office more and more every day. Then it kind of died, died down a bit. Then I started coming back again. Right now, I'm at this point where I haven't really gone in the office that much. I've mainly just been at home, which in a lot of respects has kind of been nice since like a few weeks ago it was snowing. So that's been great. Nice. Well, yeah, no, well, thank you for that. Um, all right, well, I think it's probably a good time to wrap up and it's getting late in the night and uh, there, there's uh, so much more information. So we will look to do, you know, more of this. You know, I wanna thank, I really wanna recognize Hazelwood Local uh, and all the groups associated with that, including uh, ARMS. So thank you, Kyle, very much. And uh, um, on behalf of the Center of Life, you know, we really appreciated to have this opportunity to get to know the community a little bit better. Uh, again, following some of my own advice, understanding you know, what the challenges are and uh, not assuming that we have all of the answers and, uh, and work together towards those. So Keep an eye out. I thank everybody. And again, you know, reach out to any one of us or follow through on any of those resources. And I wish everybody a lot of luck. So have a good night. Thank you. Bye guys. Thank you to the panel. We've had so much fun. We don't want to leave. Oh, no. yeah. <laughs> and I apologize. I didn't thank you guys. I, I should have thanked you. So, you know, I'm so, so appreciative. So I really appreciate it. All of you. Thank Shame you for this it. opportunity. So. Yeah, no that's problem, great. Problem. Uh, Anna, it was really a pleasure getting to know you and uh, let us know how we could be helpful as you continue along. And I will. Uh, thank you. Yeah. yeah and make sure you stay in touch with us and uh, stay connected. Yeah, I will.